Hey, First United, we're here at Lake Navasha. As you can tell, it's not uh, the same as Ormond Beach. We sure are sorry we're not there while the hurricane's going on. We're praying for safety. Uh, we had a chance today to go to the Anua graduation, hear a few pictures of the graduation. There were 176 graduates of young men and women uh, who have completed the course, have started their jobs. They were thrilled and excited, uh, as they should be, for their graduation. It was a lot of fun. We have a lot of concerns about y'all there in Ormond. We're praying for safety during the hurricane. Uh, we look forward to being back with you next week. And thanks for all your help and your partnership with Anua. Peace out. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Craig Bloker. Uh, and I serve as one of the associates at First UMC Winter Park. So the senior pastor at First UMC Winter Park is David Miller, who is in Scott's Covenant Group. So David is also with Scott in Africa, trying to stay out of, uh, out of trouble there. So um, that may be a bit of a challenge when you get both of them together. The one uh, rule that Scott gave me as we were emailing back and forth about this morning was not to create any messes that he had to come back and clean up when he returned. So that is my goal this morning uh, as I am here with all of you. I'm grateful, grateful to be here. Um, some of you may remember, I was here uh, a few months ago, so it's good to be back with you all, um, with you all again. So let's, let's begin and bow our heads in a moment uh, of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in worship this morning. God, we pray that uh, we are safe, that we can gather here without any, any worries uh, to, to our persons, to our threat. But God, we, we pray particularly um, as, the, as the hurricane is on its way. We pray um, especially for those that are in the Bahamas. Uh, that are directly in the path. We pray for your provision, your protection uh, for our brothers and sisters in the Bahamas. We pray for all of those who may be uh, in, the, in the path of the hurricane. God, we pray that you would be with each person, that you would deliver them, um, and that you would uh, keep each of, each of us safe uh, as well. And uh, God, we just, uh, I just, I pray uh, for your spirit, that the words that I speak this morning may be your words, that we may have an encounter with you, the living God, this morning, that we may be equipped and empowered and excited as we leave this place to be ambassadors of your love and your truth and your hope and your grace in a world that is desperate for it. We pray this all in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is good, uh, as I said, good to be here with, uh, with all of you this morning. Uh, one of the most interesting books that I've read over the last few years, it's called Tribe. It's by the journalist Sebastian Younger, and in it, he lays out his case that as human beings, we have evolved to be connected and in community with one another and that that has come under threat by living in a modern, individualized society. He says, in fact, he says there are many costs to living in modern society, but the most dangerous loss may be to community. And one of the, the main uh, examples that he uses to build his case is earlier in our country's uh, history, in the time of the colonies, that there was a, um, a fascinating uh, thing that would happen, and that would be between Native Americans and the Europeans or the colonists, the, the relationship that they had with each other, and that there was a flow from one side to the other, and, but it was almost entirely and exclusively from the European side towards the side of the Native Americans. Ben Franklin remarked on, on this, and he said that any Native American that came and they educated and taught the customs, right, of the enlightened Europeans, uh, if this child uh, ever went back to see their family, there was no hope that they would return to the Europeans. In contrast, there were a number of uh, Europeans that were held uh, captives by the Native Americans, 
and that they, their ransom may be paid, they may be brought back into a culture or treated kindly, and yet many at the first chance would actually return to the Native Americans that had captured them. A historian that had immigrated from France uh, remarked uh, about this, and I think it's, I think it's a profound um, reflection as to what was happening. He says, uh, uh, thousands of Europeans are Indians. So, obviously a little different language than we use uh, these days. Thousands of Europeans are Indians, and we have no examples of even one of those Aborigines having from choice become European. And then he remarks, there must be a social bond, something singularly captivating and far superior to anything boasted of among us. I think it's a, it's a fascinating picture that there were these uh, Europeans, right, that uh, as far as technology, as far as wealth or comfort, had far beyond what the native peoples would have had, and yet there was something magnetic or captivating about the Native Americans' tribal way of life. And so the, uh, the author is using this to make the point that there is something deeply rooted in each of us where we were created to be an intimate community with one another. And that today, that has been disruptive. He says, continuing, the author, Sebastian Younger, he says, a person living in a modern city or suburb can, for the first time in history, go through an entire day or an entire life, mostly encountering complete strangers. They can be surrounded by others and yet feel deeply, dangerously alone. Now, part of that might be our fragmentation digitally, that we feel connected to a whole bunch of people in very shallow ways, that that has affected our ability to connect in profoundly deep ways with our neighbors and in our community. Now, Sebastian is not the only one who is making this case. In the United Kingdom, four out of 10 uh, Brits express chronic and profound loneliness to the point that the prime minister established a new position, the minister of loneliness, to combat this problem in the United Kingdom. Cigna, the insurance company, so now we know there's economic uh, ramifications to the loneliness that we are experiencing culturally, estimates in their study that over 50% of Americans are lonely today. The American Psychiatric uh, Association lists loneliness as a greater threat to public health than obesity. And another uh, study likens chronic loneliness, health ramifications, to as if you were smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, this is a profound, uh, profound information, particularly in a time where we live in the, the wealthiest country that has ever existed, where we have um, access to comforts that, that even decades, not to mention centuries ago, would have, people would have longed to have had, and yet throughout, uh, throughout human history, we have some of the highest rates of, of mental health, of depression, and of suicide. Now, I brought a picture as well this morning. And the artist, I think, captures part of, uh, part of what the author, Sebastian Younger, is talking about. Now, the, uh, the, the uh, sculpture is called A Monument to the Unknown Bureaucrat, and it is found in, in Iceland. And in it, I think it's fascinating that, uh, that this worker is in their typical uniform. They have their suit on. They're carrying their briefcase. But, of course, it, it, it doesn't matter at all what they look like who they are as a person, that really has diminished them to just a cog in the worldwide economic machine, right? It doesn't really matter who this person is. It doesn't really matter what their interests are or who, uh, who their loved ones are, what their relationships are. They're really just a cog in the machine. Now, that would be one thing if it was only out there, right, in the world. If, as the church, we've figured it out and we have a profound sense of connection and community, but unfortunately, that's, that's not really where we find ourselves either. Now, I do believe, and we will get there, that that is exactly what God has created the church for. 
that the body of Christ is to demonstrate what a community of loving connection looks like because we recognize that we were created in the image of God and created for connection and community with one another. Now, a 2019 LifeWay survey uh, came out and said that less than half of Christians agree with the statement, I intentionally spend time with other believers to help them grow in their faith. Now, this is the stat that really stood out to me in this line and that I want to confront uh, together this morning. That is just under two-thirds, 65% of respondents, who are all Christians, to the survey, agreed with the statement, I can walk with God without other believers. I can walk with God without other believers. Now, I think that that is profoundly incorrect. I think scripture would point us, and we'll get to that, as as Paul refers to um, believers as the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ, connected to one another. But particularly as United Methodists, where our history came from a renewal movement in the church, where Wesley believed that part of our formation required being connected to other believers. That, in fact, we can't even grow in our faith if we are doing it alone. He puts it this way. He says, uh, confronting solitary religion. So he's actually addressing those early uh, church leaders that that felt that if they were surrounded in the world, in culture, that they would be uh, tainted. And so they would, they would go off into the desert so they could be alone in their study with God. And so they would read scripture and they would pray alone, separate from everyone else so that they could be most attuned to God. And so Wesley is pushing against this tendency in the early church. He says, holy solitaries, or that is if we just go off and just me and God, we can figure this out on our own, is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Now what he's saying there, sometimes uh, we can confuse that. What he's not saying is he's not referring to social justice, though certainly as demonstrated by particularly the early uh, Methodist movement, that we as Christians are to be extra specially attuned to the needs in our community and to serve sacrificially to address those needs. But what Wesley is saying here is that it is impossible for us to grow in our faith alone. We have a social religion. That is, it is required that we are connected to one another. Now, as we turn to our scripture passage this morning, uh, Robert Foster, longtime professor at Fuller Seminary, writing about Paul, as we get to one of the Paul's letters, he said that, that Paul assumed an interconnectedness in the church. Now, most of these churches met in people's homes, that they were closely related. And so when Paul is writing a letter to a church, he is assuming that there is an interconnectedness and relational dependency among the believers to whom he is writing. Now, I think Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. summarizes this beautifully in uh, part of a letter from Birmingham jail when he says, he says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And this is, this, is the, this is the good stuff here. And remember, in, in this letter, he is writing to a bunch of um, white moderates in Birmingham that have pushed back and said, you're, you're going too quickly in the civil rights movement, a number of which were Methodists. Uh, and what he is saying to these feller, fellow ministers in Christ is saying that we need to do this together, that in fact we are connected to one another. That is how God created us to be. So he, in this, expresses profound wisdom and peace with his slow brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the inner related structure of reality. I love this image that Dr. King gives us as if we were woven together in a garment and my string may only intersect with your string at one point, but that we are actually 
woven together into one piece of fabric. And that one piece of fabric is God's story throughout all of history. And so with that as the frame, let us turn to our scripture passage this morning. It can be found in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now in this passage, all of the yous that Paul uses in Greek are plural. So all of the yous can be read as y'alls, right? Now, I grew up in Ohio, so I was one over, and I never got uh, Pittsburgh. Do we have any Pittsburgh people here? Is that yins, right? The yins, the plural, instead of y'all, it's yins, which never made any sense. So we do have a yinzer uh, here this morning. So when I came down to the University of Florida, I started to adopt y'all into my vocabulary, and that is exactly what Paul is using here. So he's talking about our own personal spiritual growth and development, but not individually, you all. Y'all's development or growth in God happens together. And we see this image. So we see therefore, right? So beginning verse 12 starts with therefore, which always serves as as a signal to us that it's connecting to something that had been written before. And so in that, Paul is talking about where we take off our old selves, almost like it would be a a piece of clothing. And so he gives gives two lists of five things that we are to remove from our old selves. Now, Wesley uses the language of, of, of illness, right, that we were sick and that we are made whole, or of of sleeping, that we were once asleep and then we are awake in God. But here, what Paul is using is there's, we take off the old self and we put on the new self. And so he gives two lists of five things that we are to take off. So I promised Scott that I would not create a mess uh, for him to clean up next week. So I will let him deal with the five things that we're taking off. uh, And we're going to deal with the five things that we are to put on. So Paul says that we are to take off all sexual immorality. So I'll leave that one to him. Impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. That we are to take off all anger and rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. And on to that, we take on our new identity, the identity that we find in Christ. The identity that we find in and through relationship and connection with one another. The five traits that then we add in our new self are compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, this passage sounds nice. It's one of those nice passages in Scripture, right? It talks about patience and bearing with one another and forgiving one another. But what I like in this is that there is a profound sense of reality, right? It says bear with one another, which means one another need bearing with. It says forgive one another, which means there are times when someone is going to do something that requires forgiveness. It says admonish one another. It means that there are things that need admonishing. Paul is not glossing over that everything is all easy and swell in this Christian community, rather that that is a part of the journey together, that we don't just um, remove or say, well, this is too difficult, so I'm just going to do me and God alone. Paul is saying, no, you all together take off your collective old self and put on your collective new self. Now, uh, the, the passage, the, the verse, the phrase here that really stands, and so we're going we're gonna to stand and park there for a moment, because it's almost like an overlook for this passage, and really all of the implications of the gospel throughout the New Testament. 
the, the, the foundation that Paul roots his argument on. He says, forgive one another as Christ forgave you. Now that is a particularly high bar. It is also important for us to recognize that that means that when we receive the forgiveness of Christ, that is not something that we receive and that we hold. Rather, we receive the forgiveness of Christ so that we can forgive others, right? This is not something that we hold on to. If we receive the forgiveness of Christ and yet do not offer forgiveness, do not seek unity and forgiveness and reconciliation within the body of Christ, then in fact we have missed the gospel all together. And then we see in verse 15, so as we move through the passage, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Now, whenever we see these calling statements in Scripture, they can serve to us as a, as a check. So when we are not feeling at peace, it should serve as a, as a check to us that something is off within us. Either maybe we've gotten a little sleepy in some parts of our old self, or we've put in some of those old garments of self back on, or maybe we've taken on a little, a little bug, a little illness, of our old selves. And so when we are not feeling at peace, and I don't know about you, uh, but that happens occasionally, right? That is, in fact, something that happens weekly or even daily, that there are parts of our day where we recognize we are anxious, where we are angry, where we are not at peace, not as it talks about here in Scripture. Because what we see here is that we have a, a call towards perfect unity, a call towards perfect peace. It's those tricky adjectives that we see throughout Scripture that don't let us, let us off easy, right? In, in Thessalonians, we see the, now, rejoice in all circumstances, right? Pray in all times or pray without ceasing, that God doesn't give us wiggle room, that we are called towards, and as Methodists, we believe that we are going on to perfection, or we are going on beyond where we may even think God may be working in us, that God has called us and has equipped us through the Holy Spirit towards growth and maturity beyond what we would even expect for ourselves. But Paul doesn't stop there. He continues in verse 17 as the closeout for this passage. And he says, and whatever you do. So he's, he's writing. So if we picture what is going on here, that the church uh, would, would be gathered together, they would be reading this letter in worship. But Paul doesn't say that peace, this only happens here as we gather in worship as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because he says, for whatever you do, so as you leave this place, as you go into the world, the lordship of Jesus Christ is over and in and through every element of our character, every relationship that we have, every conversation that we are in. Now, in that, that's not something that we can do alone. It's something that requires growth. It's something that requires patience. And so the, the question that I would have, if we reflect back on that image and how the, um, that sculpture may be reflected even in our own church communities, that it may not be a suit that we put on, but maybe our Sunday best or Florida casual, as we would do here near the beach, right? And instead of a briefcase, we may grab our Bibles or our families, and we go to church, and I say this as a confession of what I find myself doing, is that we exchange pleasantries. How, how are you? How was work this week? How is the family? Are you going anywhere? What are your preparations for the hurricane? Where really, it doesn't matter at all who that person is, because I ask the same questions to whoever I'm speaking it doesn't matter who God created them to be, what their heart, what their desires are. And so looking towards Paul's letter to the Colossians, I hope that it calls us past those easy platitudes that we would put ourselves into asking, where is, is God working in your life? What are you really excited about? Where have you seen God in your life? Now, maybe that would be, and I'm sure Scott would be fine with me giving a little homework. It doesn't have to be this morning. But what would it be if, if you grab coffee or lunch with someone else that you haven't really spent time with 
here in this congregation and just to ask those questions. What's your faith story? How, how has God moved in your life? What are you worried about? What are you excited about? Another example of this, uh, and this is something that I am, am grateful. So as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that the senior pastor at First Winter Park and Scott are in a covenant group together. And they've been in this covenant group for a number of years. And I appreciate that because they have carved out time in both of their busy schedules, right, with church stuff and family stuff and vacation and whatever it is that they are doing. They're saying, we're going to take intentional time to gather together to make sure that we are praying for one another, that we know what is going on in each other's life, that we are reading scripture together, that we are supporting one another through what is the rockiness inevitability of life. Now, that's not something that's fast. That's not something that's convenient. It's something that requires carving out space and time. But if we begin to view our participation in the community, not as, oh, we're just making another acquaintance, but rather it's a way that God has created us to be, where we grow in our relationship with God, and God has invited us and equipped us and called us to help each other grow in relationship with him. Now, in the closing lines of his book, Sebastian Younger says, says this. He says, Solidarity is at the core of what it means to be human and undoubtedly helped deliver us to this extraordinary moment in our history. It may also be the thing that allows us to survive it. Now, in it, it's interesting because he's, he's very vague as to what that solidarity is. He references some things that we're supposed to be with one another and connected with our neighbors, those that, that are kind of live intimate to us in our communities, that we can go through hard times together and be there for one another. But he gives no concrete examples of what that solidarity might be. But what we gather in worship on a Sunday morning and take time out of our day to worship with one another, we are recognizing explicitly what he may have an inkling of implicitly. Now, we would call that provenient grace, that he has some inkling that as human beings, we were created for something bigger than ourselves, something that requires being connected to one another in real and profound and deep and transformative ways, but he wouldn't call that that we were all created in the image of God. That every human being that is living and walking on the face of this earth has the image of God imprinted on their souls. And that God has reached out and desires a relationship with each and every one of us. And so when we say solidarity, it's not some kind of empty of we need to just be connected to one another and maybe we should grab lunch with someone. What we're saying that the solidarity is rooted in the God who created us and the God who loves us so deeply that he sent his son down to this earth to live and to die, to reconcile us into perfect relationship with him and to relationship with each other. A.W. Tozier puts it this way. He says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. We gather in worship so that we can collectively turn our eyes outside of that powerful gravity that causes us to focus inward and to look towards and to be grateful for the God that loves us so much that he withheld nothing that he withheld nothing and sent his son for each and every one of us. And so this morning, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. Dietrich Bonhoeffer the, uh, started a, a, a seminary, an illegal seminary in Germany during uh, the rise of the Nazis. He ultimately was arrested and executed for resisting Hitler. And at the end of his book, Life Together, which is a book on Christian community, 
He says, communion is the superlative fulfillment of Christian fellowship. And when we participate in human together, we are acknowledging two things. We are acknowledging, one, that we come as individuals to take communion, recognizing that Christ died for us individually. No one can come and take communion for us, right? As a sacrament, we come and we take it as individuals. But we don't come up alone. We're not allowed, right? We can't. It is uh, against the definition of communion. We can't have communion without communing with one another. We have to be with other believers. And so when we take communion, we do so individually. We come up as individuals to take it, but we also do it together, for it comes from one loaf, and that we all participate in communion together. So as we come forward for communion, we come in our brokenness, we come with repentance, maybe repenting of some of the old self that we need to lay down. Maybe it's greed, maybe it's anger or malice or slander for a fellow brother or sister. But then as we take the communion, we believe that something real happens because the presence of Christ is with us. That as we take communion, we take on the peace and the wholeness and the truth and the hope that Christ offers each of us together. Would those assisting with communion please come forward? On the night in which Christ died, he took the bread, he gave thanks to the Father, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to the Father, gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you please pray with me? Join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.